Father, on this night, we have gathered in your house, and we are confronted. Confronted with the seriousness of our sins against you and the fate we deserve. And though that breaks our hearts and moves us to repent, we also rejoice tonight because of your righteous Son, who came and lived and died and rose to make us your very own. As we remember these two truths tonight, Lord, help us to take them to heart. Help us to repent where we have sinned against you and make sure that we leave here tonight knowing without a doubt that we are forgiven and saved because of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I think it was maybe not even quite a week ago, I was talking to an attorney. And I wasn't in his office for, for this issue, it was something else, but after that was taken care of, I actually asked him about wills. All right? My wife and I have talked for a long time of finishing up our will so that all of our things are taken care of so, so we don't have to leave that burden to our kids or grandkids. And as we were talking about that, he said, well, that's pretty typical, right? We've put it off year after year. We keep pushing it down the road. And he says, most people do because it's not a topic we like to talk about, right? Death, our own death. Yet, something he said that, that I can keep hearing in my mind, he said, even though we don't like to talk about it and people push it off, though, the statistics don't lie. 100% of people will die. That's a sobering reality, isn't it? That means that, that whoever you're here with tonight, whoever maybe you're watching with online this evening, if you look to your right, if you look to your left, at some point, they will die. Someday your wife will die. Someday your husband will die. Someday, if it hasn't happened yet, your parents will die. Eventually your kids and your grandkids and great-grandkids that you haven't even met yet will die. A sobering reality to be sure, and maybe that's also a reality of why we, we don't like to do wills and we don't like to talk about death, even though we know we can't stop it. Think about it. What do we often do when, when people die? <laughs> or even maybe when we go to that funeral or that memorial service or, or that visitation, right? Oftentimes we try to talk about anything and everything but the real reason we're all there. Someone died. All right, we, we, we try to tell stories, we throw flowers at it, we throw sympathy cards at it, but no matter what we do, death is there. And even if we don't want to speak of it, we know it's coming for us. In fact, that's such a reality in life that, that maybe we start to even think that death is just a part of life. You ever heard somebody say that, right? Death is just a part of life or the circle of life. Maybe we've said it ourselves, but I want you to know tonight it's actually not true. Did you know that? If somebody says death is a part of life, as a follower of Jesus, I, I want you to jump up and down in, in the best possible way, though, and say, not true, because it's not. In fact, I can still picture one of my professors back in school when we were talking about this topic, and, and he even said, right, you're going to think this. The world's going to say this. People are going to say, death is just natural. It's a part of life. It's not. Don't believe the lie. And you want to know why that's a lie? Because God never intended you to die. Put your hands up. Humor me. Come on. If you're, if you're watching online, do it. Wiggle those fingers. God never intended those fingers to get old and frail and full of arthritis and eventually die. He didn't. Want to do another one? Your ears? 
God never intended these ears to go silent, to lose hearing over time and eventually go completely silent and deaf. He didn't. You want to know why we know that? Because of what God tells us in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Right? At the creation of the world, God created everything and didn't intend it to die. And at the end of week one, the end of the week of creation, God had one more thing to create. And it was going to be his masterpiece. As if the ocean waves and the mountains weren't enough, he had one more that was going to be his crowning creation. And it was going to be different than any of the other things he made. And he was going to do it in a special way. He wasn't just going to say, let there be. He was going to actually use his own hands and his own breath to create. And so what does he do? He takes a scoop of some of that dust and dirt of the ground that he made that was perfect and awesome. And he molds it and shapes it into a man. And then God himself breathes life into man and he becomes a living being and God calls him Adam. And then, if that weren't enough, God helps Adam to recognize something that, that all the other animals have a partner, but, but he doesn't. So, so then God creates woman. And he brings Adam and he brings woman Eve and he brings them together to be interdependent as husband and wife, to work hand in hand. And just imagine marriage before the fall, never any fights, never any problems, never any issues or beefs, because it's perfect. But God's still not done yet. Right? God then takes Adam and Eve and he places them in this beautiful, perfect, awesome garden where they lack nothing. They get to live there. They get to work. They get to play. They get to enjoy. God says, everything is yours. Except. There was a tree in the middle of the garden that God said, I don't want you to eat from. You get everything else. I mean, imagine that. It's like God saying, you get an entire buffet of your favorite food, never ending, but that one little cookie, I don't want you to touch that. Adam and Eve, don't eat that tr from that tree. And at first they don't, right? And, 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 and refraining from eating from that tree, what were they doing? They were praising and thanking the one who created them and gave them all things. In fact, Martin Luther once said that that tree for Adam and Eve was like them coming to church. It was their, their altar, their pulpit, their font, where they could go and worship by not eating. They worshiped God and were praising and thanking him for what he had done. For a while, it was great. But then it happened. And Satan rebels. He's cast out of heaven. But he's not done. He goes and pays a visit to Adam and Eve. And he tempts them. He deceives them. He gets them to doubt the goodness and love of God, right? To God really say that actually he knows that if you eat you're going to be like him and he doesn't want that so he's withholding goodness and love from you what kind of god would do that and they bought it they bought that lie and they ate and then literally all hell breaks loose because with that sin comes death and not just death, but, but also a host of, of, of all kinds of other consequences. And, and we're going to look at a few of those right here in Genesis chapter 2, right? God is speaking and he says, cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. <laughs> Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. It 
Isn't it kind of ironic that the very materials that God used to create Adam would now be his constant reminder of his sin and his fate? Right, every time Adam goes out for a day's work in the fields, every time he has to pick the weeds and the thorns and the thistles and fight that, he would be reminded of his sin. Right, every time he, he washed the dirt from his hands of a day's work, he would be reminded of his sin. Every time he tried to come home and, and, and Eve's there like, uh-uh, you're not coming in with those dirty sandals and, and feet, you need to wash the dust and dirt, he would be reminded of his rebellion against God and where he was going to return someday because of it. See, when Adam sinned, the curse of sin stretched far and wide. And it didn't just affect Adam, it affected Eve, but that was not all. Remember the first murder in human history? It wasn't between two gangster gang rivals. It wasn't between two countries at war. Cain killed his own brother. But it didn't stop there either. Adam and Eve gave birth to sinners. Those kids gave birth to sinners. Those kids gave birth to sinners. And as you heard in Psalm 51, right, conceived in sin, that pattern repeated until your grandparents gave birth to your parents, who gave birth to you, who gave birth to kids and maybe grandkids, all tainted with sin. You know, tonight we, we've been talking about this topic of, of ashes and, and what that means. And, and I want to kind of help you understand where this practice came from, right? Because this is not a practice that just came from somewhere out of the blue. It wasn't just a certain church body or denomination. This goes back to Old Testament times. Think of Job. Remember Job? Job loses his kids all in one day. He loses his livelihood, his businesses. He loses his own health. And if that weren't bad enough, he had friends that basically said, hey, you did something wrong. God's punishing you. And then his lovely bride over here is saying, Job, curse God and die already. And what does Job do? In different parts of the book, in one part is when he is feeling sorrow over his own sins, he sits in ashes, and he puts on sackcloth. You know what that is? Some really scratchy kind of material. No one's going to want to wear that, but he does that as a, right, as a sign of his sin and his sorrow over it. Another great example in the Bible of ashes pointing to sin and repentance is Jonah. Jonah goes to Nineveh. They actually repent, and the king declares, let's all put on sackcloth and cover ourselves in ashes in a sign of sorrow over what we have done against God. And so tonight, God reminds us of the same thing, that from dust you came, to dust you will return. Because right? you see, whether you came up here or not, the smudge on your forehead or on your hand is not just a smudge we get to make ourselves look a little more religious. Because if that's why you did it, wash it off now. And that ash that, that maybe you wear tonight is not just to say, well, God, look at how sorry I am. I'm so sorry that I even put ashes on myself as if somehow that will make God forgive you or love you more because it won't. But you know what it does or what it can do? It reminds us of our sin and what we deserve because of it. And I know that's a heavy thing to talk about, but we probably don't talk about things like that a whole lot in our lives, do we? 
Because you see, I don't know if you're anything like me, this is where I struggle with, right? It's so easy for me to look out at others and see the smudge on them. It's so easy to look at, at my spouse and my kids and, and the people I work for and see their sinful smudge, but not my own. And I would guess you sometimes struggle with the same thing. It's so much easier to see spouses and your kids and your classmates and your coworkers, your fellow Marines, your retirees, whoever it is, it's easy to see their smudge and their sin, but not your own. But you know what these ashes remind us of tonight? You know what they do? They put the blame squarely on where it belongs. You and me. You know, thankfully, I'm not ready to say amen yet. Some of you might be checking your watches and wish I would, but, but I think you're going to be glad I, I'm not saying amen yet because that's not the end of the story. Right? Adam's story did not end there. Job's story did not end with his sin. The Ninevites' story did not end with their sin, and, and neither does yours. Now, I, I didn't read these verses but two verses before the ones we started reading tonight in Genesis chapter 3, God started speaking. And he wasn't speaking to Adam and Eve about consequences yet. He was looking right at Satan. And I can almost picture God looking at Adam and Eve and said, you need to listen, you better listen to this and write this down. I am going to put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and hers. And you know what the offspring of a woman? That would be Jesus, my son. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to strike his heel. Oh, he's going to die a horrible death on a cross, but through it, he's going to crush you. And you're going to be done forever. Did you catch that, Adam and Eve? I got you. I'm going to fix this. What you broke, I'm going to fix. Because I'm going to send my son. And so thankfully... The story doesn't end with our sin and rebellion. It ends with Jesus. It ends on a cross. It ends in an empty tomb. In fact, right, this is the journey we start tonight. And that's why you got to come back. Please don't be this your only service that you come to, you tune in. you got to come back. Keep coming back every Sunday. Because you know what we're going to do every Sunday during Lent? We're going to look at everything Jesus endured for you. Your guilt your shame, temptation, grief, weakness. He's going to endure it all so that you and I will be set free. In fact, he's not will do it. He did do it. Past tense, it's done. And he finished it on a hill outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha when he said it is finished on the cross. Yes, from dust, you came and dust you shall return, but because of Jesus, that's not the end. So, I would love for you to do something tonight. As you leave here, as you go home, before you wash off that ash, and even if you didn't get it, before you turn off the lights, take one more look in the mirror. And I want you to, one, remember how serious God takes sin. Your sin and mine. In fact, so serious that someone had to die and it was Jesus. But then I want you to keep thinking and remembering. I, I want you to know that, that although you can wash this stuff off pretty easy with some soap and warm water, you can't erase what it symbolizes. Only Jesus can. And he did. And so put your head on that pillow tonight, remembering that truth, the last thing remembering that Jesus already did. And so the wages of sin is death. From dust you came to dust you shall return. But forgiveness and life are yours, all because of Jesus. Amen.